This week is Parshas Ha'azinu. And Ha'azinu means to listen, plural listen. And we are on the last day of Moshe's life. It's the last day of his life and he's giving his final departing messages to the nation. And this week and next week or next Parsha are going to be the final messages. And Ha'azinu, out of uh, 54 sections, uh, I would say it's certainly the most difficult one in my assessment to try to understand and certainly to try to teach because it's written in, in a poetic form and therefore uh, this you know it's up subject to a lot of interpretations and you look at the various commentaries and they don't necessarily even agree on what the subject matter of the verse is. Uh, so what I figured I would do is to try to understand each verse alone or to take verses as independent entities and try to pull the lessons that we could have some sort of practical lesson for ourselves. Uh, but also to kind of balance that out by giving uh, an overview of the whole Parsha and the thrust and the theme of the Parsha in general. Uh, because I found three of the medieval commentaries, the Rishonim, they say the same thing about this whole Parsha. And they, they structure it the same way. Uh, Rashi, for example, says that every verse has to be understood in multiple contexts. You have to understand it as a reflection of the past – and Moshe is giving them kind of a, a, a sense, uh, a sensibility to look back and try to learn lessons. But also, uh, it's a prediction to the future. So it's this balancing that you're reflecting on what happened yesterday and you're forecasting what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, which, of course, creates a lot of problems to understand it. But that's just a, an idea. Uh, and the lesson that Rashi tells us, and again, we'll see that uh, as well with the other commentaries, is that um, it's kind of cliche. But here is where we say history repeats itself. And Moshe is telling them that there's these certain kind of laws that the Almighty is baking into the world that uh, cause an effect that's going to result in very specific consequences for certain kinds of behavior. And we're encouraged to look back and see the mistakes of the past uh, or, of course, as they say, if we don't learn from the mistakes of history, you're doomed to repeat it. That's Rashi. Now, the Sepharno, he breaks it down a little bit more uh, granular level. He he, he explains that the Parsha and indeed history, it follows this, uh, this theme, this cycle uh, where uh, it begins with talking about humanity at large. And we know you look at the Torah and it begins with Adam. And Adam, he doesn't – there's no Torah to Adam and there's no Jewish people to Adam but there's still meaning and there's, there's this broad meaning of humanity and then invariably – uh, the way things go is not everything works out as planned necessarily. And then the Almighty kind of zones in. Okay, the Abraham. You know, Abraham and to the exclusion of everyone else. Abraham is the fo- focal point in the Jewish nation. And uh, the Jewish nation and everything's really good. And things are wonderful and he's embracing us and he's giving us all these goodies and he's treating us with such care and focus and, and love. And we have everything. And because things are so good, we rebel and we reject him. And the famous verse, we'll see in this week's parasha, we get fat. And you get fat and you get ungrateful. And once you're ungrateful, you forget about God. And God says, oh, you forgot about me, I'll forget about you. And I'll look at everyone else. I'll go back to the, the original cycle where, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not con- – I don't have a ne- necessarily a, a special treatment, chosen nation, all that. I'm going to look at everyone else and everyone, and everyone else can do whatever they want with you. And invariably, they do, and we suffer. And then we suffer, we reach out to God, and he once again brings us back to that original point where he's going to care about us, and he's going to love us, we're going to repent, we're going to go back to Israel, and we'll be there until, unfortunately, we f- if we fall into the same trap of getting fat, forgetting God, it's going to repeat itself again and again, uh, which is a very interesting kind of um, prism to look at Jewish history uh, through because, you know, uh, this Parsha, verse number seven, actually has a mitzvah to remember the days of yore, to look back, to ask your parents, to ask your grandparents, and they'll teach you. Uh, we were the first nation uh, to start documenting history and to start understanding it because – and trying to learn lessons from it. Uh, and I think this is the Parsha where we say, okay, let's look at big picture Jewish history and try to find patterns and trends – uh, and see God through history. The Jewish idea of theology 
is, uh, of course, it's an idea of an infinite omnipotent power who creates everything, but is also involved and is also manipulating and navigating uh, us through history. Uh, so th- th- those are the broad themes of the Parsha. Uh, let's dig into a little bit of the context here. So it's it's very, very poetic. Moshe is introducing the comment, uh, the, the, the section. Uh, he says, uh, listen to the heavens while I speak. Let the earth hear what I say. May my teachings drop like the rain. May my utterance flow like the dew, like the storm winds upon vegetation, like raindrops upon blades of grass. So you can already give a se- you have a sense uh, to c- kind of the flair uh, of this um, uh, of this section. Now, if you look at a book, a, a, a book of the Torah with Rashi, you'll notice that there's a proportion of how much on the top is the text and how much on the bottom is Rashi. And if you'll notice in this, if you compare this parsha to other parshas, you'll see that there's a disproportionate amount of commentary uh, because it's written with it's, it's all hidden. Everything. What are the what are the meanings? So we're going to try to unpack this. And it's interesting if you actually look at the teacher's edition of the book, you look at the uh, the Torah version that has all the com- oh, many many commentaries. There's like one line of text and two pages of these tiny letters and commentaries. So there's a lot here. We're going to try to get as much as we can while covering the whole parsha. So Rashi says, uh, what's this idea of calling out to the heavens and calling out to the earth? And Rashi explains, well, the heaven and the earth, they were there at the time where Moshe spoke, and they're here today. So what Moshe is saying, essentially, is that this, what I'm telling you now, it's something as fixed in nature as heaven and earth. Heaven and earth were there on day one of creation. And they're there at that time when Moshe is speaking, the last day of his life. Uh, according to Jewish tradition, it's uh, 1272 BCE, and they're here today. And what he's telling us, whatever I'm telling you, is a fixed law of history like the heaven and earth. And the heaven and earth are going to be my witnesses that I'm saying this to you, and they will, if, if, if we ever have a question as to whether or not this happened or not, the heaven and earth will come testify. Moreover, heaven and earth, they will be the implements of a lot of the predictions in the Parsha, because the heaven will stop giving rain, or perhaps give way, way too much rain, and the earth will not yield produce. And of course, that they are the they enable us to live life uh, in 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 a, in a good sense. Now, when he talks about rain and raindrops and all that, Rashi goes a whole several cha- several paragraphs to explain that all these different kinds of rain. There's four different kinds of rain mentioned. These are references to Torah. And how Torah is so as essential to spiritual life as water is to physical life. And that's the comparison. That's why I'm comparing it to rain. Uh, you know, when they talk about the search for extraterrestrial being or planets that can maybe be hospitable to life, the first thing they care about is their liquid water. Because if there is, there's something to talk about, even though there really isn't. But at least you can even talk about talking about something. Uh, and that's the most essential thing. And thankfully, the Almighty placed it. It's so ubiquitous. Everywhere you go, the, 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 you know, is is water, and it's so fundamental and essential. You can't go a day or you know, two days without water, and you're already in peril. When we talk about Torah, Torah is water for the soul, and Torah is water for the soul, and therefore, Torah is also as essential for the soul as water is for the as water is for the body. And thus, Moshe is invoking that at the beginning. He's giving them a, kind of an, an overview. When I'm telling you with Torah and mitzvos, it's like the rain. Uh, that said, uh, I saw one of the commentators writes that just like, you know, if you put rain on a, a plant, uh, the rain is good for the plant, but the plant itself needs to grow. You know, we have to kind of take Torah and integrate it into ourselves and kind of absorb it like a plant would. And once you absorb the Torah, that gives you the energy to spring forward. And now there's also... Um, another introduction to this whole section in, in verse 4. Verse 4 reads, The rock, which is a reference to God, uh, as an aside, uh, during the writing of the Declaration of Dependence of Israel in 1948, uh, there were so many different camps in the Zionist camp, and uh, many of them were very uh, religious, like the, the Mizrahi, the religious Zionists who had a say, had a, had a seat at the table, of determining the text for the Declaration of Independence. And there were many ardent uh, secularists 
who wanted no part of religion and they were looking at it kind of in a socialist, communist, uh, Zionist uh, sense. Uh, so they had a problem. Do you mention God and declaration or not? You know, you have the religious Zionists who see Israel as a culmination of 2,000 years of pining for Israel, going back to Zion and bringing this messianic era. And you have a, a, a different faction, uh, maybe even more powerful, larger faction that has, that, that, that is, has abandoned has abandoned God uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in you know for uh, for all practical purposes. So they came up with a compromise, and the compromise is that they wrote uh, Tzur Israel, the Rock of Israel. And here we see uh, Hatzur that God is called the Rock, and uh, but the Rock could be interpreted as other things. You know, maybe it's the uh, I don't know. It's it's the Zionist dream, or maybe it is the IDF. It could be it could be a lot of things, and that's the way they made everyone happy, which is a lot of what happened at the beginning of the of the founding of the state of Israel. As an aside, uh, but the Rock, perfect is his work. All his paths are justice. A God of faith without iniquity, righteous and fair is he. The commentators and the Talmud they understand this verse as a description of God and how God meets out reward and punishment and uh, how things are fair. Uh, we say that, like the rock. Right? Rocks don't change. Uh, they don't have moods. Uh, they have fixed rules. And we're saying that God is like this rock who's fair, perfect in his work. All this paths are justice. There's no iniquity. Everything's going to be righteous. And um, Rashi, for example, says is that the way the Almighty works is measure for measure. Exactly what someone puts in the input is what they get in the in the output, <laughs> and that's both with reward and punishment. Moreover, Rashi says, even though the Almighty is very powerful, and he could punish with a tsunami, he could unleash everything. He doesn't. Rather, he does with justice. The punishment is always fitting for the transgression because perfect is his work, which is an interesting kind of praise of God. We're saying that God doesn't punish more than necessary. And the question is, well, why would God punish more than necessary? Like we're saying the money is, is perfect because he doesn't do more. Well, what would be the rationale to punish someone more than the crime that they have committed? And I think this does uh, lend us an insight to the whole point of punishment or godly punishment. Uh, we think of punishment or certainly our criminal justice system is about having good behavior. I don't want to get into political discussion as you know, but it's not about rehabilitation. It's about – it's not about the criminal per se. It's about the society. And how do we have a society uh, that is cleansed from criminal elements? Uh, if you wanted to have good behavior – you do what we do, but you probably do it the way Singapore does it, where outrageous penalties and fines for any sort of bad behavior. Like if, you, if you're caught selling gum, it's like – there's no gum in Singapore. If you sell gum, it's like illegal. It's like contraband. If you sell gum, it's like a $100,000 fine you know, and three years in prison. You know? And you know what? There's no gum, which – a lot of people like gum. I'm actually okay with that law. Um, <laughs> uh, if you steal your neighbor's Wi-Fi in Singapore, it's like hundred thousand dollar fine and two years uh, in prison. It's outrageous. Uh, but you know what? There's no crime. You know, if you're caught with an ounce of cocaine, they'll execute you. That's it. Done. Uh, and if you want to have a, mo- a model society where everyone's behaving exactly, there's no crime. That's what you would do, or you would do what they what the what the guys doing in the Philippines now, right? Drug addict, just shoot him dead. Damn, that's it. You know, and you know what? Eventually, that will actually have it will, in aggregate, it'll be better. And you know what? That's an example of having punishment that exceeds the crime, and that's to have good behavior. What we're saying here is that the money is measure for measure. What it, what it means is that the punishment is exactly perfectly tailored to fit the crime, and the idea being is that when someone gets the punishment and it seems to represent his previous his or her previous behavior it's actually a lesson for them and it's a wow i did this i received measure for measure maybe i ought to rectify my ways it's not about having good behavior they might could force us uh, to have good behavior like you know, he could unleash 
like they do in Singapore, right? It's 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 you know there, there's just incredible punishment, and then everyone behaves okay. But the money wants to nudge us to give us the free will, and give us the conditions, and gives us the Torah in order that we can choose if we choose we can choose good if we choose to allow ourselves to be affected and impressed by his little messages that he's sending to us. Now, there's another, uh, the Talmud on this particular verse, and the Talmud says something very uh, striking, which would explain another reason why there might be punishment. Uh, on the next section of the verse, uh, God of faith without iniquity, what does that mean? El emunah ve'ein avel. So uh, whenever it says uh, emuna or uh, Rashi, actually, Rashi actually brings this down, uh, faith or trustworthy, God's, God's trustworthy, God's fair, you know, God pays his debt, so to speak, uh, where he, he says that there's no cronyism. If a tzaddik, someone who's righteous, if he sins, God's fair, just like God punishes the wicked, God punishes the righteous. And on the flip side, what if someone is a sinner? He's a Russia. And he does a mitzvah. It's a minor mitzvah. But he does a mitzvah nonetheless. God is fair. God does, with, does not withhold any reward. And he will receive the word just like the tzaddik receives the word, even for the most minor mitzvahs. But what is interesting here is that the Talmud says that there is a distinct discrepancy as to the venue of reward and punishment for the tzaddik. And the Russian. This is the key. This is the key to unlocking the whole, uh, the whole uh, conundrum of bad things happening to good people. Like this is the source. This this particular verse. What the Talmud says is that when tzaddikim they get rewarded in olam haba, and they get punished in olam hazeh. They get rewarded in the world to come, in the spiritual world. They get rewarded spiritually. And they get punished physically. That's what the tzaddik, the righteous. And that's regardless, they get punished physically for even a minor sin. And they get rewarded spiritually even for a minor mitzvah. There's nothing that's not that's unregistered. Whereas the wicked, it's the exact opposite. They get rewarded physically in the physical world, in the physical sphere. And they get punished spiritually. Everything's fair. But that's just the way it is. And thus, just so what are the implications of this idea, of this breakdown? The implications are is that, well, you see a righteous person who has a miserable life in this world. Okay, that's because he is going to be punished. Everyone does some measure of sin, punished in this world, rewarded in next world. But everyone gets – everything's fair. God's like, There's no iniquity. Everything, God's righteous. God's fair. Everyone gets rewarded and punished for their deeds with precision. The only question is the venue. Right? We, are you going to be punished – Physically or spiritually, are you going to be rewarded physically or spiritually? That's what Rashi says. And thus, you see a wicked person who has a great life here. Okay, he's being rewarded physically, but he'll be punished spiritually. And you see at Sadiq, uh, good things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. Here's your answer. That's what the Talmud says. Now, of course, we could debate and discuss it, right? But just, just the, that's the baseline. Just to understand what, what, what is the kind of context of this idea. And this is the source. Now, it is interesting that the, um, the the Talmud is basing this idea, this kind of uh, uh, eschatological uh, quandary on a verse that talks about God being fair. Now, the Talmud also says, for example, that one iota of reward in Olam Abba, in the spiritual world, outweighs all the reward in the physical world. So if you get, according to the Talmud, the Mishnah and Pirkei Avos, we're going to study that soon. If you combine all the physical pleasures together in the physical world, it cannot equate to the most minor pleasure in the spiritual world. So the question again returns. If the Talmud is trying to say, oh, God is fair, God is trustworthy, Every, even, the, even the wicked, they get their due. But how could it be fair for someone, uh, two people do identical mitzvahs, the tzaddik and the rasha. The tzaddik is rewarded for it in the spiritual world. And the rasha is rewarded for it in the physical world. And we're saying, oh, the mighty's fear. The mighty pays his debts. But wait a minute. The mighty's paying the... Uh, the mighty's paying the wicked in, 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 a, in a 
less valuable currency, so to speak, whereas the, the righteous person is getting much more valuable currency. So that's the question. I, w- I want to just give a, a, the core of the, of the answer, uh, and that is is that what defines the tzaddik and what defines the rasha? How do you get that classification? The answer is, is that everyone gets to choose which world they want to prioritize. And in the world that they prioritize, that's the world that they choose to accept the reward. So everyone is opting in and everyone's choosing. Maybe they're not, they're not aware of it, but if you think about it, they said they would say yes. Their behavior and their ideals and their priorities determine by their own choice which world they want to prioritize and which one they want to deprioritize. So the Russia is someone who says, I want my reward here. I want to be paid in pesos. And the side says, no, I don't want to be paid in pesos. I want to be paid in kilos of gold. And okay, the money's fair. And that's exactly the point. The money allows people to choose which world they want to be rewarded in. And if someone wants to be rewarded in the spiritual world, the money will say, okay, I will withhold any payment. You're not going to have me. I'm not going to give you. I'm not going to pay you. I'm not going to cash out of the stock while it's uh, still valueless or minimal value. I want to wait till it goes, goes up. And therefore, the money's fair. And the, and the Russia says, no, I want to be paid in this world. Listen, I'm fair. You, the guy wants, the, he wants to be paid over here. Let him cash out early. It's, is it to his detriment? Of course. But that's the Almighty's choice. And that's the person's choice because the money is fair. And uh, just to round this out, um, what that means is, is that we have to be very – or it would be prudent for us to be very careful and wary – of choosing to say, I want reward here. Like the, like the Mishnah says, and this is a little bit of a spoiler because we're going to start learning Perky Avos soon, but there is a teaching in the Perky Avos in the chapters of the Fathers that says that Hakina v'hataiva v'hakavod motzim esa adam mina olam. Envy, lust, and honor take a person out of the world. So all the commentaries say, listen, if someone has lust, if someone has envy, if someone has honor, they can't live. They can't, they, they, they're so consumed. They, they, don't, they can't live. They, they're out of this world, so to speak. That's what everyone says. What I want to say is that this particular Mishnah is explaining how someone chooses which world they value. If someone is envious, they see someone else's physical world, so to speak, physical reward, and they're envious. That envy in this in itself is a choice that they're making to prioritize this world. And therefore, they get taken out of the world. Which world? The spiritual world. They're choosing with their envy to be rewarded here because they're prioritizing this world and therefore they get rewarded here. When someone is lust, they're lustful for physical pleasures. You're lustful for physical pleasures. Okay. Is that what you want to be paid? How you want to be paid? Sure. Right? But you're t- you get taken out of the, the world, which is the world, the spiritual world. And honor, right? I do a mitzvah. Reward me. Reward me here. You want to be rewarded here? Okay. Here's your honor. Here's your reward. You want it? It's it's to your detriment again. But if someone chooses that, God is fair without iniquity and God will reward someone in the venue that they choose to be rewarded. And pretty remarkable idea. Okay. So corruption is not his. The blemish is his children's, a perverse and twisted generation. So um, we're going to transition now in talking about misdeeds of the children of the Jewish people. And this is a, – it's, it's a very hard verse as all of them are to unpack here. So I, I found the Arachayim, one of the great commentaries in the Torah. Uh, he, he explains this, I think, in a, in a very fascinating way. Uh, well, the, way he, the way he kind of breaks down the sentence is that – when the when the Jewish people when they pervert and corrupt their way, they cause bad to themselves. They cause evil to themselves. And uh, so the first point is is that the mitzvahs are not for God's sake. It's not like God benefits from us doing a mitzvah, as we would think normally. A monarch gives a edict. It's it's for his benefit. No, the mitzvahs are for us. And therefore, if we corrupt our path, it's our loss. And the way he breaks down the verse is she is low. Low, low, and then he says low banav, which means that the loss is that we lose the status of being children of God. If you remember, we spoke, 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 spoke at the beginning here that they might have started off the world and it was, it was Adam. Adam is an amalgam of all humanity. 
and then it breaks down to, to the Jewish people. We have a special status. We're the chosen people. We're called children of God. However, elsewhere we're called uh, slaves of God or servants of God, subjects of God. And we exist on two planes. We can be sons of God or children of God, or we could be subjects of God. And how does someone treat their child very differently than someone, how someone would treat their slave or their servant or their subject? And therefore, when we corrupt our path, we become low banav as if we, we, we're no longer treated as his sons, rather as his subjects. And that is, of course, to our own detriment. And then he explains that uh, mumam, the blemish, there's a, there's a blemish for someone to go corrupt, so to speak, go awry away from the path of God. That is because we all have an inherent uh, uh, penchant for, for sin, which, according to the Talmud, a person only sins if they have temporary insanity. Uh, because, and the way the Talmud understands this is that, well, to sin, by definition, is to act as a body in uh, in opposition to the best interests of the soul. It's prioritization of an ephemeral, transient being, even though it's going to damage the spiritual and eternal self. And therefore, that in itself, says, says the verse, can be considered as if we have a blemish. Again, a lot to unpack there, but this shows of, of what, hap- what are the consequences of sin and what are the conditions that could bring us to make that. And the verse continues by saying, you're doing this to Hashem, O vile and unwise people? Is he not your father, your master? Has he not created and affirmed you? When it's a very sharp criticism of sinners, that when someone rejects what God tells them to do, how can they reject God who does so much good for them? And then it, it begins uh, the discussion of history. And it tells us, remember the days of yore, understand the years of generation after generation. Ask your father and he will relate to you, your elders, and they will tell you. Again, this is the source of the mitzvah in the Torah to study history, uh, to study Jewish history, to find out what happened in the past and find out uh, what – and we, you know, the, a lot of the Torah is dedicated to the stories. And you say, well, Torah means mitzvahs. Torah means commandments. Torah means instruction. And then we have a lot of stories that don't seem to necessarily relate to practi- practical, actionable action for us. And here's perhaps the answer. We learn about what happened to in our past, and those stories are – they are uh, uh, instructive because they show consequences of behavior, both good and bad. It's interesting that it talks about your, uh, your father and your elders. You have to ask your father and he will tell you, your elders, and they will relate to you. So what, are this, what is this father and what is this grand – elders, which also can mean grand, grandparents – So Rashi says that the father refers to the prophets. He gives examples that prophets are called fathers. And the elders, that refers to the sages. And those are the kind of the dual instructors and visionaries of the Jewish people. And now it's interesting that it calls the prophets as fathers and the sages as grandparents or as elders. Uh, another, Another interesting point is that it uses different Hebrew words for he will relate to you and he will tell you. Uh, the word for father is v'yadgedcha, which means a more kind of harsher, stricter form of instruction. Whereas zikeinecha v'yomrulach, your elders, and they will tell you it's much more pleasant. And perhaps we can say is that, well, a prophet is given a mission by God to, you know, like a father, you know, who... Who does a grandchild, you know, ha, ha, what's the relationship with their parent who needs, you know, bedtime's at seven, so that with, as opposed to the grand, you know, the grandparent, here's a lollipop, right? That, that's kind of the relationship. Uh, and the parents sometimes get frustrated that the grandparent is messing up all their pedagogical plans because they're being so loving to the, to the child. And uh, the parents uh, tend to be more strict. And the idea being is that a, a, a prophet or a prophet comes and there's no nonsense, and he says, like, this is the way, this is the law of the land, this is the way it ought to be, and there's not very much flexibility. Uh, whereas the role of the elder, the role of the sage, like the ra- grandfather to inform the people what they should do, it's much more of a, of a, of, of a pleasant uh, interaction. And both those two together, right, well, you, you, if you have too much of, of one and not the other, 
you don't have a unified message and it's not a balanced message. Uh, and the message I would say that we have to give to our children and the message the Torah wants to give to us is a little bit of both. There has to be some rigidity and there has to be some flexibility. You know, there has to be uh, uh, some elements of our uh, conveyance and of our, of our lessons that are non negotiable. Uh, you know, they're fixed and they're rigid and they're set in stone. Whereas there's other parts or there's other elements where there is some flexibility. I think it's a good lesson as parents, but certainly as uh, uh, grandparents, I would say, as teachers, and uh, of course, as students as well, um, of how to have a cohesive, a unified, uh, total message that's going to reach its, uh, be most impactful. Uh, verse 8, another very powerful verse. When the Supreme One gave the nations their inheritance, so what should we ask our grandparents? Go uh, back uh, to our inheritance. He separated the children of man. He set the borders of the people according to the number of children of Israel. So this, according to Rashi, according to others, this refers to the time uh, all the way in the time of the dispersal, the beginning of, of Genesis, where all the nations were mixed and they mighty parsed them out and spread them out. And then it says, according to the number of the children of Israel, if you actually count how many nations we have uh, at the beginning in Genesis, it's 70. And how many souls came down to Egypt? Also 70. And there's this balance. And the term 70 comes up a lot in, in the spiritual sources. For example, the Sanhedrin. There's, there's 70 members of the Sanhedrin or 71. Uh, and there's 70 languages, 70 nations, 70 souls. And the idea, it's a Kabbalistic idea, but the simple idea is that 70 is completion. And completion in itself doesn't mean anything. It could be completely good or completely bad. But we're told is that the souls of Israel, they are in opposition. They stand, so to speak, as the counterweight to these 70 nations. And it shows us our role. You know, we're small. We're 70 souls compared to 70 nations. But we're balanced because what we stand for is holiness and purity in God. And therefore, the other nations which don't necessarily uh, embrace those ideals, we're the balance and we're going to hopefully bring each of the 70, nation, 70 souls is going to contribute towards perfecting um, the whole 70 nations and 70 languages. Again, very deep ideas here. Uh, next verse, also some incredible stuff. Uh, For Hashem's portion is his people, Jacob is the measure of his inheritance. Now again, whenever you read the translation here, this uh, translation is, is you know, it's a lot easier to translate uh, pure narrative than it is to translate poetry or a song, as this is called. Uh, so you lose uh, 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 the ability to understand that at multiple levels whenever it's translated, because whenever the, the translator has to choose which simple idea or which basic idea to follow in their translation. Uh, but in Hebrew, Tichelek Hashem Amo. Chelek means a portion, but chelek also means smooth or chalak, which means smooth. Um, so we're told, and we're talking about the Jewish people now in their acme, in their pinnacle, in their zenith. And they, we were selected. We, we're this counterweight to all the rest of the world. And we said, we, we were described as the nation of Hashem is chelek. Is, so which could mean it's God's portion. It could alternatively mean is that we are smooth. And if you remember all the way back at the bifurcation of the Jewish nation from uh, Jacob and Esau, the first one of the first descriptions is that we have is that Esau is really hairy, and it, and Jacob is really smooth, and uh, the relevance of that doesn't seem to be immediate. But the deeper sources explain, like the Midrash explains, is that uh, the the the, uh, the of course Jacob sins. And Esau, so the sins are the same, perhaps, or at least they're, they're, the sins are equal on both sides. The, Talmud, the verse tells us in Scripture, tzadik ba'aretz, ain't tzadik ba'aretz ashi yastob le'echta. There's no tzadik, there's no righteous person in the land that, that never sins. Well, so if everyone sins, what's the difference? The difference is, is that Jacob is smooth. After he sins, he doesn't let the sin to be absorbed. It kind of glides off, it slides off. Whereas Esau, when he has a sin, he doesn't, he doesn't shed himself of the sin. It gets caught up, so to speak, gets trapped in the hair, so to speak, of him, and, it, and then it becomes part of him. And of course, again, I would say um, we have the upcoming high holidays, and our objective is not to say, well, we never sinned, we're good. Our objective to say is, yeah, we sinned, but let's try to make ourselves smooth. Let's try to allow that this, or, or cleanse ourselves from the sins and not allow them to 
cleave onto us and to become part of us, let them slide right off. So that's one idea in this verse. An additional idea, Yaakov Chevel Nachalaso. So the way they translate it, Jacob is the measure of his inheritance. But Chevel literally means a rope. The word Chevel means a rope. And Rashi here says that there's this rope, there's this link, there's this chain. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Jewish nation. It's like it's like you know we have a past. We we have you know we have we have a glorious antecedents. That's what Rashi says. Rabbi Chaim Volozhner, one of the great personalities of the uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, in his book Nefesh Chaim, he talks about the, uh, a human existing. There's this rope, so to speak. We think of ourselves, you know, uh, a body and soul, and we're a fusion of the two. Uh, but we think that we exist as a body and we have a soul. Or we exist in this world and the spiritual world is from for tomorrow. The way he understands this, this particular verse, is that we actually exist on multiple spheres, on multiple planes. We exist in this world as a body. We exist in the spiritual simultaneously as a soul and we're bound together by this rope. And that's how he understands uh, this particular verse. And he explains that uh, the Midrash tells us that there's there's balance in creation. So on day one of creation, you have heaven and earth. So the, the, the cosmos are represented and the earth is represented. And day two, uh, you have the rakia, the, the firmament, the upper world. But on day three, you have the vegetation. So there's, again, balance. And then on day four, you have the luminaries of the heavens. You have all the constellations. And on day five, you have all the animals and crawling uh, creatures on, the, uh, on earth. Again, balance. And on day six, you have a human, which is body and soul. But moreover, it's the not it's both worlds are being represented. It's not like if the human was oriented entirely in this world, just he has a little dose of next of the spiritual world, so to speak, in him, then it would still be an imbalance. We're still primarily in this world. However, to understand the midrash, obviously the midrash is telling us is that we exist simultaneously as much as we exist in this world. Presently, we exist in the spiritual world ple- presently, which, again, I think it does complete a lot of what we spoke about earlier, but a very deep idea that, uh, of course, in our minds, uh, by default, we only see this world. And that, of course, is the problem, or that's the hump that we need to overcome. That's the obstacle. That's the hindrance. That's the hurdle that we need to you know, that's what Torah is there, to make us realize that we exist in the spiritual world as well. Again, very deep ideas. Let's move on to the next one. Um, he discovered him in a desert land. You might have found us in the desert, in desolation, in howling wilderness. He encircled us. He granted us discernment. He preserved us like the pupil of his eye. Um, what does this mean? He surrounded us. He uh, gave us insight. So Rashi, he tells us that he surrounded us well, we had those clouds of glory surrounding us. We had all those flags surrounding us from every side. He enshrouded us with a mountain when he turned the mountain us uh, upside down uh, upon us. That's what uh, that's what it means he surrounded us. And then he gave us wisdom. He gave us Torah. So one of the commentaries asked, if you remember, at Sinai, the Midrash tells us, the Talmud actually tells us, that the Almighty took the mountain and turned it upside down like a barrel above the Jewish people and said, if you accept the Torah, good. If not, I'm going to crush you. And here Rashi brings that as an example. Oh, the Almighty loves us so much. He took us out of a desert. He took us out of desolation. He picked us up from, the, from being at the absolute lowest point in, 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 in human experience. And then he took us and he surrounded us and he, and, and he gave us insight. Like he, he, he infused life into us. As one of the examples, he actually threatened to destroy us by taking the mountain and putting it on top of us. How is that positive? So I heard an amazing answer from uh, uh, Reb Nachum Pertzavich. Maybe you haven't heard, but he was one of the great Rashi Yeshiva, heads of the Yeshiva, of the Mir Yeshiva, biggest Yeshiva in the world. And he says something fascinating. He says, when the Almighty, and of course, this is probably more relevant to the discussion of Sinai, what happened at Sinai, but when the Almighty turned the mountain upside down, First of all, we don't, that, that probably, you know, that, that it, it, it's not, don't think about the mountain per se, but think about what the implications are. The Talmud says the implications are is that we had no choice. We were forced in, we were coerced. And therefore, because we were coerced, maybe we could wiggle out of the deal. This wasn't a, what, a ha- 
at hand transaction, whatever it's called, where the transaction is based upon uh, both sides uh, not being forced into it. And therefore, the Talmud says, well, maybe we could sneak out of it. Maybe there's some loophole that we could unburden ourselves from Torah. And ultimately, the Talmud says, well, at the time of Achashvero, uh, Shat Purim, they accepted the Torah out of love. Put that aside. But either, either way, what this means is, right, what's the positive sense here? What it means is, is that we became obligated. We became compelled to have Torah. We couldn't free ourselves from it. They might have forced it upon us. What that actually means on a spiritual level is that the Almighty changed the nature of our nation physiologically. We became physiologically different than we were prior. We became, we developed a new need, so to speak. Previously, we could have survived without Torah. The Almighty says now, Torah is now hovering above you. And if you accept Torah, good. And if you don't accept it, you're going to be destroyed. What that means is it's not just at the time of Sinai, 3,329 years ago. It's much more than that. It means that there's always this proverbial enshroudment that we have. We're surrounded by the mountain. We always have this, uh, the sword of Damocles above us. If we reject the Torah, the money actually is changing what we are. Now we actually become dependent on Torah. And now that is actually a good thing. He changed us. He made our soul more heightened in our collective national consciousness that our soul now needs to be fed or else, which Again, it's a very positive thing, very deep thing, very deep ideas. Some more deep ideas, um, just 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 very quickly because I don't understand them myself. Um, so how am I going to teach them? But um, uh, the Kabbalists talk about the Almighty, uh, the the two ways the Almighty interacts with the world. There's what's called misavev uh, kol almin, the Almighty surrounds the whole world, or memale kol almin, or fills the whole world, and uh, there's the Kabbalists of sources talk about the Almighty surrounding the whole world, um, whatever that means, whatever kind of inter- way the Almighty treats us in that ideal uh, as being manifest here. Uh, now, the, Almighty, the verse says that the Almighty guards us like the pupil of his eye. Rashi says, just like light, we know that our whole world is illuminated by you know, our, our, our vision, our, our sphere of vision. But it all comes in through the tiny little pupil. That's where the light enters. And once it enters, it so to speak just fills up our whole perspective, even though it only comes in through its small hole. And here we're told the Jewish people are like the pupil of the eye. What that means is, is that when the Almighty gives light to the world, so to speak, spiritual light, we're the pupil. Even though we're really small, but that's the portal of spiritual vitality to the world is through the Jewish people. Again, these are very deep ideas, but uh, let's move on. Okay. Uh, and themes, and it continues with the amount of kindness that he does for the Jewish people. Hashem guided us alone. We don't have other forces that we have to filter God's um, vitality to us through. Uh, he made them from the heights of the land. He would have them eat ripe, ripe fruits, suck all the honey from, this, from, this, from a stone, oil from a flinty rock. They might have given us a lot, a lot of goodness. And again, this is where there's going to be a change in the cycle. Now where things are great. They might have pulled us out of desolation and gave us all this goodness. Things are really wonderful. And just read verse 14 here. Butter of cattle and milk of sheep with fat of lamb, rams born in Bashan and he goats as wheat with wheat as fat as kidneys. And you would drink blood of grapes like delicious wine. Things are amazing. Things are fantastic. And when things are so good... Yeshurun, which is a nickname for the Jewish people, became fat and kicked. We rebelled against God. You became fat, you became thick, you became corpulent, and you deserted God, its maker, and was contemptuous of the rock of its salvation. Here's where this shift happens in, 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 the, in the section, where we start rejecting God. And why do we reject God? Because we became fat. What does that mean? So um, there's an amazing comment here by the Sephorno. What he says is that for us to have an interaction with God or interaction with Torah or through Torah, we have to be able to deal with nuance, with subtleties, with small things. And what he says, the Sephardo says, is that when someone is overly indulgent in a physical world, in a materialistic world, they begin to lose a sense of subtlety. And the sense of subtlety is necessary to understand Torah and by dint of that or by proxy of that to understand God. 
this is an interesting idea where just like, you know, to understand anything, you have to break it down to what are the components and what are the, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the categories, what are the subcategories, what are the details? And you, you see, you know, I would, not to go there, but in politics, right, the, the people, they dumb it down. They make a simple slogan because that's just one idea that's everything. But what about policy? And the more nuance you get, the more you lose the crowd, right? Because they don't know that. They don't have the sensitivity for the subtleties. And that's really what matters. And to really understand the subject, you can't, it's not about the headlines. It's not about the, uh, the slogans. It's about the nuances to really understand the, the details. As an example, you understand the human body, right? We now know that the human body is comprised of, of, of billions or trillions of little interconnected cells that operate – that themselves are comprised of so many different parts and are comprised of these atoms and these subatomic particles. And that's really what we are as a human. To understand us on a granular level, you can't just say this is one thing. This is a lot of micro – billions of micro little things and they're interacting together and to understand the big picture. And you want to understand Torah. You have to break down an mm-hmm. idea to smaller parts and understand the subtleties. What we're saying here, when someone becomes fat, it doesn't mean that they become physically fat. It means they become spiritually fat. They stop to have this capacity to understand or, or to, to have the sensibility to think about the more minor, to parse things out and therefore that kickstarts their rebellion against God. To understand God, you have to be committed, and you have to be uh, you have to be nuanced. And therefore, someone says, uh, uh, "I think you hear a lot, right? More wars are wars of whatever religion, right? That is a it's a thing you hear quite commonly. Atheists say, "Well, I'm not into religion because religion kills a lot of people." So that is a very non nuanced attitude. It's not questioning, okay, well, what are the merits of it? How does religion benefit for, for us? Or, well, doesn't territory kill more people because more wars are fought of a territory than religion? So should we be living, live, all be living floating in the sky? Because, uh, or what, well, if it's true, uh, doesn't life kill everyone? Doesn't everyone die through life? So, should, so life itself is bad because life kills more people than even religion does. I'm just saying, like, it's, it's not a nuanced argument, but that's an example of someone you know, humans are, are we're, we're, we're gifted with amazing capacity to understand incredible things. And we're told we can understand God. Of course, we can understand God himself. We can understand God through Torah. But we have the ability to connect to things that are much greater and grander than ourselves. However, we can lose it. And here the Torah is predicting, and we know throughout history, we have lost it. And then everything spirals out of control uh, as a result. We start embracing other gods. Uh, they would provoke his jealousy with strangers. They would anger him with abominations. They would slaughter to demons without power, gods whom they not they knew not. Newcomers recently arrived, whom your answers did not dread. We start losing what it is that makes us special. We lose our identity. We're embracing other f- foreign gods. And uh, we ignored the rock who gave birth to you, forgot the God who brought you forth. Uh, Hashem will see and will be provoked by the anger of his sons and daughters. He will say, I shall hide my face from them. And see what their end will be. So we reject God. God rejects us. There is uh, like the uh, cherubs, the kruvim, uh, in the tabernacle. The relationship that we have with God mirrors the relationship that God has with us. We choose how we want to have this relationship. And that's why the sources tell us that the cherubs, they would be facing each other under ideal circumstances, almost like hugging each other. And that's representing the Jewish people and, and God. But alternatively, at other times, they would be facing away from each other. These were, these were even though they were made out of gold, but they were infused with this spiritual power to be a manifestation of the Jewish people's relationship with God. So we turn away from God, God turns away from us. However, we turn, turn towards God, God turns towards us. And we cover ourselves and we don't want to see God. God covers himself and doesn't see us. And once, once we don't have God's protection, we're vulnerable. And we're vulnerable to our worst enemies, those 70 nations, so to speak, that are our counterweights, well, nothing could stop, uh, the, uh, nothing, nothing can uh, attack us if we have God. Remember, God surrounding us, we have the greatest uh, Kevlar uh, to their attacks. And no matter what they do, it doesn't matter. But if God turns away from us, then what happens? We're vulnerable. And what's going to be? Uh, they provoked me with a non-god, 
with a vile nation, I shall I anger them? Okay, what's going what's to happen to them? Uh, so shall I pervert them with a non-people? Exactly measure for measure. We adopted, or the Jewish people in history have adopted idolatry. It's a non-god. It doesn't have any power. Okay, what's the exact measure for measure? There's going to be a non-nation that's going to attack the Jewish nation. Uh, what this means, so it's interesting, you look at all the commentaries, some find parallels between the Babylonians, they weren't a real nation. I saw one of the medieval commentaries talking about the Christians and the Crusades. How could these people be considered uh, a nation? Uh, look how they behave. Uh, uh, in modern times, perhaps you could say the Palestinians, are they really a nation? When was this nation ever uh, extant? Uh, moreover, uh, a non-nation, right? If someone, if a nation does not abide by the Geneva Accords, right? Such a nation is much harder to do war. They may be uh, weaker comparatively to a state power, so to speak. But if they don't obey by the laws of combat, they're a much more dangerous foe to have. Uh, and, th- and things really go bad. For fire, I, I have been killed in my kindled in my nostrils and blazed to the lowest depths. It shall consume the earth. It's produce that set ablaze what is founded on, uh, on mountains, right? We were founded on mountains. We were founded at Sinai, this, this great uh, this, this great point in, in history, and we're going to be destroyed. If you look at that verse, it describes fire four times. Commentaries say that's the four exiles, uh, the four times the Jewish people suffer uh, under uh, foreign oppressors and things. Again, it's, it, it's, it's really... It deteriorates, uh, accumulate evils against them. Uh, there'll be famine. Uh, they're going to fight these flaming demons, teeth of beasts. I shall dispatch against, against them. Uh, the sword will bereave. There'll be dread. The young people, everyone will suffer. And then I'll scatter them and I'll cause them to, their memory to seize. They'll lose their identity as a unified nation. They'll be scattered amongst other nations. Uh, what's going to save us? Uh, the fact that the enemies of our the enemies are going to save us. Ironically, verse twenty seven. Uh, were it not for the anger of the enemy that was pent up, um, the enemies will say, "Oh, look at us! We conquer the Jewish people. Uh, we destroy the people of God." That ironically is going to be our salvation or help towards our salvation. And it continues the, 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 with talking about what's going to happen with the enemies. That ironically, when a, a nation conquers Israel, that often marks their uh, decline uh, because they cannot triumph, so to speak, over the Jewish people and therefore they disappear. And we see this, of course, it's not immediate, uh, but over over history, right? The, the, the Greeks, they had their heyday and then they attacked the Jewish people and then soon afterwards uh, they were overtaken as an empire. And the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Persians and uh, the Romans, uh, whenever they had their uh, treatment of the Jewish people, uh, and uh, they destroyed them and they set them scattering, scattering or uh, fleeing, they, um, they themselves were disbanded. And finally, verse 36 talks about, okay, we've been punished, we've gone through the throes of exile, and we're now going to be brought back. He shall relent regarding his servants. Uh, he will say, uh, talking about the uh, the... The foreign gods, where is their god, the rock in whom they sought refuge? And he said, the Mahdi is telling him, okay, well, where are those idols that stood up? You, you want to embrace those idols, and then you were punished. Well, where are those idols? Did they stand up for you? Uh, See now that I am he, and no god is with me. I'm the one who gives death and life. That's what God is saying. I strike down, and I shall heal, and there's no rescuer from my hand. I have the ultimate power. And eventually... Uh, there's going to be the final bringing everyone together, bringing the Jewish Jewish people back. The Mahdi is going to uh, destroy the enemies. I shall intoxicate my arrows with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, because the blood of the corpus, the corpse and the captive. Uh, the Almighty is going to exact revenge. And a critical verse here, O nation, sing the praises of his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will bring retribution upon his foes. And he will appease his land and his people. This is the ultimate coming together. The whole world will praise the Jewish people and the Almighty will exact revenge from, uh, from, uh, for us, f- uh, from our tormentors. There's a comment here in the Ramban. Uh, the Ramban at the end. This is the end of the song and then you just have the, uh, a few more verses for, for, for the Parsha. Uh, the Ramban looks at this verse as being a reference to the Messianic era. 
Uh, and he says, even though there is going to be, uh, there has been many times the Jewish people uh, had a renaissance, uh, but what we never quite had the fact that the nations will sing the praises of our people. We may have gotten back to our land, but we did it bloody, so to speak. And you never had a time where uh, the there was total ubiquity of praise of Israel. And then he he writes – this is a, a long piece I would encourage everyone. I, I think the, the art scroll does mention it. The, the Rabban has a summary of this uh, where he, he just kind of looks at this description of history uh, in the prism of history. I don't want to read the end over here. He says, suppose – this was not written in the Torah. It was written by some forecaster or some stargazer or some uh, uh, astrologer or astrologist. And he would predict this ahead of time. He says, if someone had just written this, this alone, it would be worthy to believe in him because everything that happened, everything that was foretold actually happened and there's nothing missing. And therefore, so too, he encourages us to, 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 to believe with all our hearts to the word of God through his trust, trusted prophet through Moshe, that no one was like him, and uh, peace be unto him. Uh, which is an interesting thing. I think, you know, again, we're told to have a sense sensitivity to history. And looking back and looking forward, this is the Parsha. Again, it was very difficult. And there's a lot more to it. I'm not trying to say that I, we ca- captured it all, but we certainly got the flavor of the message and the ebbs and flows of history as a result of our behavior. And the next section is going to deal with the, the final conclusion section is the passing of the baton of Moshe to Joshua. This has happened already several times where uh, Moshe is making it known that he's going to be replaced by Joshua. And Moshe is about to die, and this is, again, another example of Moshe and Joshua conveying this message together. So Moshe, and he spoke all these words of the song in the ears of the people, which means he told them not only the words, but also the lessons and the nuances of those words. He and Hoshea, the son of Nun, it's interesting, Rashi points out that Yehoshua bin Nun, who Joshua, who's Moshe's replacement, Moshe's successor, he, he was originally called Hoshea, and when he joined the spies, Moshe changed his name to Yehoshua. And here, when he's about to achieve, to, to become the leader of the Jewish people, and to be Moshe's successor, he's called Hoshea. We're going back to the name, nickname of his childhood. And Rashi tells us something very powerful, uh, that yes, Moshe is now taking him and he's 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 bringing him alongside him to convey this message to the people. Rashi actually says that Moshe would have a crier, right? How's Moshe speaking to the whole nation? So he would speak, and then there was someone else who would repeat his words out loud, someone with a booming voice, and maybe there was multiple people like that to get the message out to everyone. Moshe says to Joshua, okay, you speak to my guy, to my amplifier, that way to demonstrate when everyone here is here together, to demonstrate that I'm actually passing the baton over to you. No one should say, oh, where were you when Moshe was around? I never heard about that. Who's Joshua? I, I give me Moshe or no one else. Um, but Joshua now, Joshua is about to take the reins of the most important job in the world. And he's about to have a stature, you know, the greatest stature of any human in the world. He's going to fill Moshe's shoes. Incredible. We're told. The second you have greatness, the second you have stature, you have to parallel that with humility. And every stage of greatness that you ascend, you have to have a parallel stage of humility. Thus, quite simply, we're saying Moshe, greatest man that ever lived, most humble man that ever lived. You have to – the humility has to be commensurate to the stature. And therefore, Joshua, you're about to take on a grand – responsibility and a greatness and stature, we're calling you Hosea. Just remember, don't forget your lowly roots and embrace that because that's necessary for you in your next stage of life. We mentioned this before. Um, we'll say it again. An individual, when they pray, they bow four times in the Amidah. It's four times that you bow down to God. We're told that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest who has greater stature than an average individual Jew, they have to bow at every blessing, so 19 times. Whereas the king, the greatest leader of the people, 
Once he bows, he doesn't unbow. He has to bow the entire prayer, right? As you scale up in the greatness, you have to scale up in the humility. Another, a few important things that I, I don't want to miss here uh, in verse 47 here. Moshe is telling them again, it, exhorting them to observe all the words of the Torah. And then he says, for it is not an empty thing for you, for it is your life. And through this matter shall you prolong your days in the land for which you cross the Jordan to possess it. So what does this mean for it's not, a, it's not an empty thing from you? So there's an amazing Talmud that says something which is, again, counterintuitive. You find a lot of counterintuitive things in the spiritual world because the spiritual world is almost the opposite of the physical world. We're told that one of the rabbis went to the spiritual world for a visit and he said it's an upside down world. Everything that we say is right side up, they say it's upside down and vice versa. Uh, the two worlds are not compatible. Uh, but the Talmud says something surprising in this, along this um, vein. In this world, an empty vessel gets filled. In the spiritual world, only a full vessel gets filled. An empty vessel is not filled. Right? We know that if you have a, you want to fill a cup with water, if the cup is full, you can't fill it with water. It's pretty full. Whereas in the spiritual world, if you want to fill someone with Torah, they have to already be full with Torah. Because if they're empty with Torah, then it has no meaning to them. And here the Talmud says, Ki lo davar reiku mitem. It's not an empty thing from you or for you. Which means if it is empty, it's because you're empty. Uh, and therefore, if Torah has no meaning, if Torah is not stirring to you, if you say, oh, I know it all, right? You're empty and you'll remain empty. Whereas if you fill yourself and the more you fill yourself, the bigger your vessel becomes and the more Torah you actually, well, it's ironic, you know, the kids who, no offense to anyone here, but kids typically, when they do their bar mitzvah, like that's it, they've done it all. Like they know all of Torah. And then you have sages who spent 18 hours studying every day for 90 years they feel like they know nothing. And they, 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 there's still so much room to fill them up with Torah. How is that possible? That, uh, that uh, dichotomy is uh, because that's just the way it is. You know, if someone's empty, then the words of Torah seem empty to them. Where if someone's full, the words of Torah seem to have so much meaning. Finally, Moshe is about to die. And Hashem tells Moshe, the last paragraph of this, of this uh, parsha, go up unto the mountain – See the land, but you're going to die in the mountain, and you'll be buried there. And you'll, like Aaron died, when Aaron died on Mount Chor, so too you will die. Because, and he mentions the sin of striking the rock and not talking to the rock. Again, just like what we said by Aaron, when Aaron died, it mentioned the sin as well. And the reason why, why is it mentioning the sin? The answer is because this is the only sin. This to the exclusion of any other. Moshe and Aaron, this is the only reason why they died and no other reason. And uh, in verse 48, it's an interesting use of term. Uh, Hashem spoke to, spoke to Moshe in the middle of the day to say, go up to the mountain. Rashi points out that there's several other places in the Torah where it says in middle of the day. Uh, once is when uh, Noah went into the ark in the middle of the day. Uh, secondly, when Abraham, when he did his circumcision in the middle of the day. Uh, thirdly, at the Exodus in the middle of the day. And fourthly, over here, uh, when Moshe is about to die. And in all four places, Rashi says, this is something that I'm going to do in the middle of the day. Why? In front of everyone. Because everyone's going to try to stop it. Right. Noah. Noah's going to go. Oh, everyone says, no, you're going to go into the, into the ark and leave us behind. We're not going to let you happen. Oh, says God, you're not going to let me happen? We're doing it in the middle of the day. We'll try to stop it. Right. Uh, Abraham, you do circumcision? Right. You're, you're going to embrace this new way of, of life? We're going to stop you. Really? Middle of the day. Right. Simply, you're going to leave Egypt? You're not going to, my wife says, no, we're not going to sneak out in the middle of the night. In the middle of the day, brought later to try to stop us. Similarly, over here, Moshe is going to die. You know, Moshe is going to die? No way. We're going to stop it, says Rashi, says the Amani, the Amani says to the Jewish people. In the middle of the day, try, come try to stop it. So what's interesting is that uh, there seems to be an incongruity here. Um, all the first three instances, it seems like maybe someone could have stopped it, right? Noah, you're going to get into the ark? We'll stop you. Uh, Abraham, you're going to circumcise? We'll stop you. Jewish people are going to leave Egypt? We're going to stop you. Here, we're going to stop Moshe from dying? How are the Jewish people going to stop Moshe from dying? So uh, two explanations that I heard. One of them is that if you look at the verse uh, 49, 
the Almighty says that there is actually a precondition here. You have to go up to the mountain. So maybe the Jewish people say, okay, we're going to barricade the mountain. And if you can't go up the mountain, you can't die. Right? It says, I said, you have to go up the mountain, then you'll die. We'll stop you from going up the mountain, and therefore you won't be able to die. That's one answer. Uh, and alternatively, it's through prayer that the Jewish people will say, we're going to pray nonstop, the whole nation, and we're going to stop Moshe from dying. There's actually a story in the Talmud, the great Rabbi Judah the Prince, when he was ill, the students didn't allow him to die. And they were praying. The whole nation was praying. And he was suffering. And the story goes that uh, the maidservant of Rabbi Judah the Prince, she went to the neighbor and she she was saying that Rabbi Judah the Prince was suffering. They, they didn't allow him to die. The whole nation was praying. They, they just didn't allow him to die. So she went to the neighbor and it was a blacksmith. And he told him, I want you to make a big, loud bang. And he takes the metal and he smashes it. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? They stopped praying for a second and he died. Uh, but there's this idea, very powerful idea, that prayer has the capacity, when done properly and done with full devotion, to actually stop God from doing things, so to speak. God says, I want to take Moshe and try stopping me. How can we stop God from killing someone or from taking away someone's life? The answer is we can't stop him through prayer. And God says, I'm not going to allow this uh, to stop me. But generally, under other conditions, prayer would, would, would barrel forth, would stop even something like that. Another amazing lesson. Thus concludes Parsha's Hazinu. And we are one Parsha left. It's been a wonderful journey so far. I look forward to next time.